Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Warner for introducing me. I'd like to thank Dr. Waltering for the trouble I'm about to get into. We usually are thanking Dr. Waltering for the trouble we're about to get into, and to Marianne as well for inviting me. For those of you who've been here before, this is not my first time speaking with you, and I have always really enjoyed this group. I think the um, level of discussion and the degree by which everyone um, is empowered and takes responsibility and wants to know more is really exciting for me. So thank you again for having me with you. And this year, we're talking about multiple vitamins, diet, supplements, et cetera. But the idea of this is that it's a way for you to be smart about your self-care. So before we start, I always ask this question, how many of you take, have done something special for, with your diet as a result of this illness? Okay, that's the patients. How many of the family members have done something special? Hey, not bad. Three of you. Okay. Or four, maybe. Um, now, how many of you take a dietary supplement? Multivitamin, something like that. Great. How many of you have told your doctor that you're doing that? This is a good group. This is a really um, assertive group because most groups, when they, there is a large amount of usage, but not much disclosure. So let's get started. I think if you're going to talk about neuroendocrine tumors, you're going to talk about complementary or integrative medicine, you have to start with Steve Jobs. Um, as you all know, he had a neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas and made a choice to do initially alternative medicine prior to then coming back into the, and back into the conventional system. But I don't think he did what I think is the best way to do this, is to do a both and approach. So I hope those of you uh, obviously are here, you're already committed to the best that conventional medicine has to offer. And the point of this talk is to augment that, reduce toxicities, improve a general sense of well-being, and as a result of that, really increase your, um, your sense of empowerment and actually not just think you're making yourself better, but to really actually be better. So, okay. So again, just to make this point, this is not a cure for cancer. There is no reliable alternative cure for cancer. It's back to the free lunch thing. There's no free lunch in the universe. But it's said now both by the conventional literature as well as the complementary literature that clinicians and patients need to be in this discussion together. Since I can't talk to all of your doctors except for the ones that are here, I think it's important for you guys to have a good sense of how to appropriately start to think about using these supplements so that when you go back to your physicians in the practices all over the country, you can bring this knowledge back to them. So we're gonna talk about setting reasonable goals. We're gonna look at lifestyle first. That's always what I recommend. There's a little bit of preventative information which wasn't available the last time that I spoke to you. And since we just heard a great discussion about how this might run in families, I think there is a benefit to think about dietary prevention. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about care, doing active treatment, symptom management, and then finally thriving in survivorship. And your survivorship begins the day you're diagnosed. And for this group, it's especially important because you will have a long life to live with this illness, and you need to know how to pick and choose among all the choices available to you to do that well. Now, risk factors. This is a kind of a standard look at risk factors. You notice that all the way on the left, the most, um, the most, the, the highest uh, risk is still smoking. Completely avoidable risk factor, primary and secondary smoke. And then all the way down the line, there's everything from, from dietary factors, environmental pollutants, et cetera. So the next highest cause of cancer is obesity. And this is probably because uh, it does affect having an active, um, an active adipose fat repository. It's very hormonally active tissue. It also really promotes inflammation. And inflammation as a process is one of the most permissive ways to um, allow carcinogenesis to happen. So a lot of what we're talking about in complementary and alternative, this integrative model, is ways to reduce inflammation. You can imagine that if there's if, if carcinoid and the neuroendocrine tumors are very rare tumors, then having actual research specifically about complementary therapies in this group of, tish, this group of tumors is really pretty much not, not, there's none directly. So we're going to do a lot of inference and take examples from other kinds of tumors and, and extrapolate them back. 
This site, the American Institute for Cancer Research, is one of the best, richest, richest, most robust sites on the internet to look for evidence about the effect of diet, exercise, lifestyle on cancer. So I think it's AICR.com. And you'll see that it's a three, almost a three-legged stool that affecting all three of these, weight, diet, and physical activity, they're interrelated. But this is the, the non-specific but highly efficient and effective way to start looking at reducing the risk of carcinogenesis altogether. Now, given the lunch we had, um, <laughs> okay, how many people besides me had the vegetarian option? Oh, yay, good, thank you, okay. Um, I asked for an all vegetable vegetarian option, but there really wasn't one. So it turns out that there actually is um, a, a evidence of a, a large epidemiologic study that was done that showed that there was a mild increase in the hazard ratio, that means the risk of developing uh, a carcinoid tumor associated with meat, intake of red meat. Now, it turns out that what there's a really strong association with is saturated fat. And this risk made the risk of developing carcinoid three times as high. So any of you who have a family member or in that one of those large families that we just heard about, these are the kind of dietary changes you should be making, absolutely should be making. So does anybody know what a saturated fat is? Okay. It's, um, it's, an, it's usually from animal sources, and it's a fat that has no more double bonds in it. So double bonds are an opportunity for an electron to pop loose. It's like having an extra electron. And then it can go find things that are oxidants that have a loose electron that's looking to bump into something, capture that electron, and quench it, roughly. So if you have a saturated fat, that has a lot more opportunities to, to make oxidative stress and no opportunity to quench it. So um, are there good fats? Yes, there are. They're in the, the left-hand category here. They're mostly um, plant-based, and from omega-3 fatty acid-rich fish, which are the dark, cold ocean fish. So seeds, nuts, olives, olive oil, et cetera. This describes what kind of a diet. If we had to give a broad name for it. Okay, I have all my um, hikers here in the front. They're giving me all the answers. Those of the rest of you who are sleeping, these ladies are gonna come find you at the break and make sure you learn this stuff. It's a, it's a very good example of the Mediterranean-type diet. You eat a lot of whole grains, you eat a lot of legumes, you eat like lentils and beans, and, um, and fish is a very uh, strongly utilized source of protein, much less red meat, and a lot of olive oil. Olive oil is a very good antioxidant, monounsaturated fat. The bad fats on this side are the ones that you go to that we had at, at break. <laughs> um, so it's partially hydrogenated fat, so you see those as partially hydrogenated palm oil and things like that, and cookies, yes, I have cookie. Um, uh, fried things, fried foods, potato <coughs> chips, all those kinds of highly processed foods. The fat in these is very often fats that are very, very pro-inflammatory. That's one of the reasons why we take a little time talking about these fats. Now, there was another epidemiologic study that suggested that higher intake of fiber especially fiber from whole grain foods, was associated with a reduced risk of cancer, intestinal cancer, including carcinoid. So but carcinoid was not singled out in this group quite as clearly as it was in the other study. So you can see the risk reductions over here. And when you see that 0.79, that means that you have a 21% reduction in risk of developing carcinoid if you ate a lot of whole grains. Um, if the fiber was from whole grains, you had about a 50% reduction in risk. And if it was just from whole grain food, you had about a 40% reduction in risk. That's how you read those kind of numbers. Now, what does a whole grain mean? You will see whole grain slapped all over everything. Um, you'll see whole wheat. Is that a whole grain food? Whole wheat bread? It depends. It could be. But in fact, hmm, OK, it's, it's trying to tell me to do something. I'm just not sure what. Um, so in fact, most whole wheat bread is white bread with some molasses added to darken the color. OK, so it's really, so this is what the wheat germ, the whole wheat kernel looks like. And you can see there's different parts of this. So we have the bran on the outside where a lot of the fiber is. The endosperm is in here. And then the, the heart of this is the germ. So if you're looking for a whole 
really a whole food food, a whole, gran, a whole grain food, one way to do is to find this symbol on the front of the food. This works really well for things you'll find in the grocery store. The um, poor man's version of this, if it hasn't been labeled, is you know how to read the, um, the nutrition facts panel, that political document that really doesn't have a lot to do with making it easy for you to understand which foods are good for you. So if you're going to find a whole grain food, you're going to find that it's high in fiber because it has the brand part still on it, and it's also high in protein, okay? So if it's a whole grain food, by definition, it has to have both all three parts of the grain, the part that has a lot of protein and the part that has a lot of fiber. So when I'm buying a, a bread, for example, I look for something that has at least, at least two to three grams of fiber and four or five um, grams of protein, and then I'm pretty sure I've gotten a whole grain product. Okay, so that was pretty much it for the specifics about uh, risk factors. The rest of the risk factors that are more general we're going to talk about in the survivor section. Now, during treatment, there are ways to sensibly and wisely use the um, resources that are in the integrative medicine tool bag to help you maximize your well-being so that you get through your treatments with the least amount of disruption and, the quick, and bounce back faster. First, we're going to um, talk about preparing for surgery. Uh, almost all of you will have or have gone or may need again to go to surgery. It's really important that you manage your nutrition well the couple of weeks before surgery because that's the time in which you're going to be wanting to make sure you maximize the nutrients that you need inside your body to be able to repair the, um, the, the, the wounds inflicted by surgery. You have to heal up an incision. You have to make connective tissue. You have to make muscle. You have to repair nerves. So the first thing is to increase your protein. And you want to increase your protein probably so that you're eating around at least the equivalent of 10 or 12 ounces of protein for the majority of you per day in the two weeks leading up to this. Now, most surgeries require that you fast for a period of 12 hours, 24, even more, and all the tests you have to do before you get there. There is a growing body of literature. This is not so much alternative, but it's a growing body of literature in the conventional literature that suggests perhaps not being quite so stringent, um, allowing clear liquids until two hours of surgery, allowing light foods um, six to eight hours before surgery, you know, really healthy um, drinks that might have a lot of protein in them and some carbohydrates. This seems to be useful in um, not activating the fat that you have to cut through to get to where you're doing the surgery quite as much. And so again, therefore improving recovery. So discuss this option with your surgery team. If you're only going to pick one supplement as being really crucial to take before surgery, especially before bowel surgery, it's a probiotic. Have you guys heard of this? Yeah. These are good bacteria. They're usually bacteria that are already there in the gut. And you want to make sure that you have all the good guys, good actors with you so that they don't um, get pushed out by the bad bacteria, which can cause problems with wound infection, sepsis, and longer hospital stays and slower recovery. And then after surgery, ginger, um, taken in many different forms. It's an herb that you're all familiar with, but it, it helps to empty the stomach, restart bowel movements more regularly, and also acupuncture. Acupuncture can be helpful not only for, um, for relieving pain, but also, again, for inducing the bowel to start moving again. And again, there's also a large group of literature growing bigger that talks about early feeding in the post-operative period to help normal bowel function be returned. And this is important to you because you don't get out of the hospital until your bowels are working. So that's really important. Now, this is two studies. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details. Um, I didn't give you a PDF, uh, a printout of my slides, but if any of you, at the end I'm going to show you my website. If you want to, if you want these slides, just send me a note to my website and I'll send them back to you in a PDF form. So don't freak out about having to write all this down. I wanted to give you an idea. I want to talk this through with you, and then you can go back to the slides for reference later. So two basic studies, one that had 60 patients, another one that had more like 101 patients. And these patients were given very simple probiotics, bifidobactus longum in one case, and um, I think a lactobacillus in the second case. And you can see for the second study, which was the larger study, that the um, risk of having a, a complication with an infection was, um, 
was much lower. It was significantly lower if they'd taken a pro people had taken a probiotic. They had less um, abscesses intra-abdominally, a shorter post-operative stay by almost 10 days, and um, that their the longest time they had to take antibiotics was significantly reduced as well. There was no difference in mortality. But clearly, there was a difference in morbidity. The group that got the probiotics, a very simple intervention, very safe, very low tech, had a tremendous advantage. Now, for the people who had infections and had to continue to get high doses of antibiotics, a very common complication is something called Clostridium difficile or C. difficile enterocolitis or colitis. This infection can be incredibly difficult to get rid of. Have you guys heard of the fecal transplant? Poop and a pill? Okay, so poop and a pill, that's what, that, this kind of enterocolitis from high doses long-term antibiotics, that's what you take the poop and the pill for. However, there's also evidence that suggests quite strongly that having a probiotic before an intervention that requires a lot of antibiotics or concurrently with the antibiotics decreases the risk of getting this very serious kind of colitis, which can really be debilitating with all the other gastrointestinal issues that come along with carcinoid you really don't want another, another common thing like that. Now, this is not a, um, this list of the different kinds of chemo, I'm sure there's like the gemcitabine I didn't put on here, full fox and full theory aren't on here. There's a whole lot of possibilities for chemotherapy, but you can see that these chemotherapies across the board have a lot of problems, gastrointestinal symptoms, soreness in the mouth, development of neuropathy, and that's not counting the, you know, the hair loss and stuff like that. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about a, a, a handful of supplements that I think you ought to know about in case you do get in a position where you have to take a, a, um, a toxic chemotherapy again, you know ways to mitigate this. This is a review article. Again, if anybody writes to me, I'll send you the PDF that um, looked at a whole, about, I don't know, over 200 references. And this is a long article, but it describes this literature up to the date this article was published that supports the use of dietary supplements during the active treatment of cancer. There was really no evidence of direct harm, and there was evidence of benefit. So if chosen strategically and a good product is used, there is benefit to be had here. What to look out for? If someone tells you something that's too good to be true, my neighbor took this, and they were worse than you, and they're now perfect, OK, it really is probably too good to be true. You should be as suspicious about cures on the internet as you are about shopping for anything else online. In fact, you should be more suspicious because your emotions are going to be engaged. It's going to be really easy to persuade you that something will work because you want it to work. You, this is the way you want to go. Um, I also don't like that people promise too much. If it's wildly expensive, that doesn't really work for me. Um, if they never show you, if they, tell, they show you cases of people who've done well, but they don't show you anything about the people who didn't do well. No, no therapy treats 100% of the people 100% of the time. So you need to have a sense of how likely this is to work, and you can only do that if you know about the people for whom something doesn't work. A lot of these alternative sites don't tell you that information. Nothing, nothing is ever completely harmless, even water. So this is to non-toxic, the doctors don't want you to know, et cetera. Those are all really bad red, red flags. Now, there are some safety concerns that are legitimate here. Um, dietary supplements can cause harm. They especially can cause harm if they are not well made. If the stuff that's on the label is what's actually in the body, most people do very, very well. The safety margin for these products is quite good. However, if, if there's a contaminant or a misidentification or a substituted herb or something else added in that's not supposed to be there, serious harm can occur. So you need to make sure that um, you get a product that either you or the expert you're consulting with is very confident is well made and is accurately reflected on the label what it is. Okay. Now. Um, I'm going to start off with some things that are generally useful for a large variety of different chemotherapies. This first one is, um, is really exciting. It's a relatively new paper published this year, and it takes a look at a substance called curcumin. Do you guys know what that is? Have you heard of that? Okay. Curcumin is the yellow-orange ingredient in the spice turmeric, which makes the color of curry. 
So if you open a capsule with this stuff, you get it on your hands, good luck, or your clothes, good luck getting it out. Okay? This material is very oily, so it's not well dissolved in water. It's very difficult to be absorbed, even in, a, even in something like alcohol. It's very difficult to be absorbed into the body. So if you just took the regular old spice, turmeric, how much would you have to take? A ton. You couldn't really. You couldn't. Because studies done in MD Anderson looking at the isolated ingredient, which is at most 3 to 5, maybe 10% of turmeric by weight, they gave up to 12 grams, 12 grams to get a good serum level. So even if you're thinking about curcumin, the amounts that are needed can be very significantly higher than you think, around 4 to 8 grams of curcumin. However, cleverly, one company has um, made a product that's attached to, to a little another molecule that ferries it across the gut border and helps it be absorbed. It, it absorbs about 10 times better. So this study looked at that exact kind of curcumin bound to what we call a phytosome, and one pill, 500 milligrams, significantly reduced a lot of these side effects here that you see with uh, that are associated with a lot of chemotherapy. So it helped reduce nausea, diarrhea, constipation, either way, fatigue, um, um, sort of weight loss and that kind of malnutrition, unintended weight loss, really. Now, why does curcumin act on such a broad array of side effects? I think it's because the mechanism of action that most chemotherapy works by, um, either breaking some bonds or, or punching a hole in the cell, or interrupting its division, it causes cells to die, and dead cells cause inflammation. The, mat the material that is used often causes inflammation. So a lot of the side effects, that achy, horrible fatigue, like you got the worst flu of your life feeling, is probably mediated by inflammation. And um, curcumin, as an ingredient, is one of the most potent inhibitors of inflammation in the cell that we've seen. Luckily for us, things that increase inflammation increase cell growth and division. Things that decrease inflammation generally interrupt cell division and growth. So that's a nice way that while you're getting at this basic target over here, you're also affecting cancer rate growth and development perhaps as well. Okay, and in fact, if you look at this list in a bit more detail, you can see the patients who took this one pill a day also had um, reduction in infections or sepsis, and their white counts were better. Now that's particularly interesting to me because that's something that's not just a patient-reported feeling, it's an actual hard number. So this is a very exciting paper and it really gives us a way with very little um, volume of material to potentially affect the overall um, adverse effect of chemotherapy. The second material that I think you ought to know about is something called glutamine. Oh God, three minutes, there's just no way. Okay, so I'm going to go really fast in a minute. So glutamine is an amino acid. This is an, a, a material that is very good at supporting the growth and development of the mucosal lining throughout the digestive tract. So this is a trial looking at oral mucositis sore, sores in the mouth that are a, a factor of, being, of the cells lining the mucosal um, tract of the gastrointestinal tract turn over very quickly. So all quickly dividing cells are affected by cancer. That's why your hair often by uh, cancer treatments. That's why your hair often goes and why your mucous membrane gets sore. And if your mucous membrane is sore, what can't you do? You can't eat very well and you can't eat very effectively. And if the rest of your mucosal tract gets swollen, then you don't absorb your digested nutrients, you don't absorb the minerals or the vitamins that you need. So suffice it to say that, that people had much less severe muco mucositis, they continued to eat better, and they continued to do better. Glutamine can also be very helpful for very slow-growing tissue like the nerves. So there's a number of studies that also show that it, it helps protect the nerves and help mitigate or prevent neuropathy. And this is a study that was used, um, that used glutamine in patients who are being treated for colon cancer. And lots of different measures of neuropathy improved. And very significantly, this is a relatively newer study, this study also showed that the effectiveness of chemo was not impaired by the use of these materials. So you'll see this later on. This is an example of the kind of things I might suggest to a patient. Now, not everybody gets everything. Not everybody gets everything at the same dose. So I think it's important that you have someone that you can talk to about this. Fatigue. How many of you had fatigue during the course of treatment? Huh. How many are still tired? Okay. 
So you first have to go through all the other causes of fatigue, uh, anemia, et cetera. You need to optimize your diet, eat frequent small meals, don't drop your blood sugar, eat protein, a good fat, and a complex carb at almost every meal. Normalize your sleep, melatonin can be helpful for that. At this time that you really feel like garbage, I'm gonna ask you to exercise because that really helps reduce inflammation. It helps with, um, it helps with fatigue, oddly enough, and it helps normalize sleep. So this is important even when you don't really feel like it. Someone that you love should chase you out of bed with a stick, okay? And then there's a couple of other supplements that could be helpful as well. And that's an example of what that might look like. This is a list from the um, article I showed you looking at a lot of supplements and the evidence for different kinds of conditions. Now, this is my last section, I'm, 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 I'm closing up. So thriving in survivorship. There are gonna be 14 million survivors of cancer this year and that number will double by the next 10 years. And there's lots of persistent side effects that can come from cancer and again, many supplements have been used and are being used to mitigate that. But I go back to lifestyle choices first. This is the AICR. This is what they recommend as basics. So you're mostly gonna look at eating a plant-based diet, being active 30 minutes a day, no sugary drinks, back to our snacks. This is from the, um, this is the government plate, which is now, it replaced the pyramid, makes sense. Your plate should look like this. Half your plate should be fruits and vegetables, quarter your plate whole grain, and less than that a healthy protein. You should add olive oil and think about water as your thing. Now, some, some supplements are not sufficiently available in food that you need to take extras. The most prevalent example of that's vitamin D. And so I would suggest that you correct any nutritional deficiencies. With a short gut, you're gonna be deficient in um, fat-soluble vitamins. With a lot of diarrhea, you're gonna be missing a lot of electrolytes. Most of us are deficient in vitamin D and should get us up to that level. A once-a-day multiple vitamin is a good nutritional um, marker. And don't take too much folic acid, it becomes a tumor promoter. And if you're not eating, if you can't get you to eat cold water fish, you probably need to take fish oil. So this is the quick list of how I want you to become cancer unfriendly, consider risks and benefits, make good choices, et cetera. And finally, this is my website, it's drmaryhardy.com, not hard to remember. And um, please join me there, I write and blog about these kind of issues all the time. If you send me a message through the website, I will send you back the slides and any of my papers that you want. So thank you for this really quick dash to this material and I really appreciate being um, invited and I'll answer any questions on the panel. Thank you.